Hello, this is a video covering the city structure of London and Sao Paulo in Brazil. We are going to look at the structure or the layout of the different parts of the city, the function or what the different parts do, and the age of the buildings in each part. And we are going to be using models to help us with this. Firstly, we are going to look at the Burgess model. This was a model invented in 1925 by Mr Burgess. It's based on American cities and the model shows different areas of the city laid out in concentric zones. The inner layer, the inner zone of the city is the CBD or the Central Business District. This is the area in the city centre where most businesses, shops and entertainment is based. The next zone out is the inner city. This contains usually many old, quite densely packed buildings and it houses city centre workers, although this is changing in many cities in modern times. The next layer or zone are the suburbs. These are mainly residential areas, they have lower density population and they have some green space. And the outer zone is the rural urban fringe. This is the outskirts of the city where urban areas meet the countryside. Here there are larger houses, a lot more open space and often high quality facilities. Around the outside of the rural urban fringe is something called the Green Belt, which is an area of countryside that is protected um, so that building is not allowed on it. And this is to prevent the rural urban fringe from impinging further into the countryside. But how does this relate to the structure of London? So here we have a map of London and the green areas on the outside are the countryside or the green belt and the grey areas are the built up areas of London. We can add a satellite image and again we can see the green areas on the outside and the urban areas in grey towards the middle. Now we can add the Burgess model and let's look at how the Burgess model fits into London. Let's start in the middle with the CBD. So London does have a CBD in the centre and this is the City of London. Um, this was the original uh, financial district of London and it's full of offices and business headquarters. And as we can see from these photos, there's a mixture of older buildings and very new buildings built in the year 2000 onwards. London is a bit different because it has another CBD and this is Canary Wharf. Um, this is a financial district and it's home to the headquarters of many large banks and other financial companies. Um, this was developed in the 2000s um, from a declining Docklands area, but it is a secondary CBD. A third CBD, is the West End. Um, now, as we know, this is um, full of entertainment and lots of exciting things to do. So we can see that London actually has more than one CBD and at least one of these is situated outside of the area where it would be expected. Moving on, the inner city. So one example of an inner city area is, is Kennington. Um, here there are a variety of house types, but they're all quite densely packed in. So we have some um, older Georgian uh, buildings and we have some, some 1960s um, blocks of flats. So it's a residential area, largely, with um, a variety of different building types. Moving on to the suburbs. One example of a suburb of London is North, is North Harrow. Here we have semi-detached, larger houses, more green space, and 
the suburbs often have their own small high streets to serve the people that are living in the suburbs, which we will come on to a little bit more in a minute. Finally, the rural urban fringe, and one example of a rural urban fringe area in London is High Barnet. Here the houses are much larger, they're often detached, and they also have their own um, high streets. There's lots of green space, and often the services and facilities are much better. So usually you'll find commuters living in these areas, they have the money to commute into the CBD for work and back out again so that they can live in an area with a high quality of life. So let's have a look at why some of these outer areas have their own high streets and their own almost mini CBDs. Um, so let's have a look at London. So this is the extent of London today in the background. We can see the grey areas are the urban areas. And superimposed on this is a map of London, how it used to be. So we can see from this map that London was actually quite a small area. This is uh, Hyde Park and um, surrounding London were a number of smaller towns and villages. Now over time London has grown and it has engulfed these towns and villages which now have become parts of London but they have retained their own um, small high streets and areas of services that look after the people living in these areas. Okay, so to summarise, um, here's a table showing each different zone and its function and the age of the buildings in those zones. So in the centre we have the CBD. The building type can be a mixture of old and new. So here we've got the City of London with a very stark contrast of buildings. And we have the West End again with a contrast of building type and, and technology here. And um, they're used for business, shopping and entertainment. And yeah, so some buildings are very old, um, but they have generally started to be modernised from 2000 onwards. And an example in the city of London is the Gherkin. Moving on to the inner city. Um, so a variety of buildings here. So some older Georgian, even Victorian buildings. These were um, sometimes replaced and redeveloped in the 1960s, um, producing these large 1960s tower blocks. And today we are seeing further um, development and gentrification of some of these areas. Now gentrification is the process of wealthier people um, moving into these um, older traditionally working class uh, neighbourhoods and therefore they're becoming redeveloped and they are they're raising the property values and raising the desirability of the area. So one example of an area that is, is being gentrified is a Nine Elms and the whole Battersea Vauxhall area. Um, but whatever the area is like, these are usually residential and they're usually very densely populated with a lot of people living there. The next zone is the suburbs. These are much wealthier and there is some retail. There are small um, high streets and corner shops and these are largely um, they were largely built in the 1920s and the 1930s when London started to really expand and push out into the countryside. Finally, the rural urban fringe. This is the, probably one of the richest areas of the city, mostly residential. There's green land, good schools, good services, and it's largely inhabited by commuters and these areas really started to be developed in the 1990s when new housing estates were built and again they were pushing out into the countryside um, and usually these areas are much more spread out and so you can see here they've got detached houses. Okay, another model that has been proposed um, is the Hoyt sector model. Um, so this was 
proposed in 1939 by someone called Homer Hoyt and it's a slight modification of the Burgess model. So we still have these concentric circles um, but imposed on top of these we have these sectors and these sectors generally uh, follow a trade route, so a road, sometimes a canal, and they contain factories and industry that have grown up there because of the good trading links and sometimes working class housing alongside these to house the people that are working in the factories and the industry. So if we have a look at London, London again, and we can see if we put the satellite image on um, that there are these white kind of areas around some of the main roads and the uh, river and these are areas of industry that have grown up over time along these transport links. Um, we can also if we add on uh, city airport and Heathrow we can see how those kind of link in to um, the accessibility of these areas. Um, so we could say uh, that London does fit into the Hoyt sector model as well. Um, we can say that London fits into the Burgess model, but there are some aspects of the Hoyt model that apply. Okay, let's have a look. So, which of these, A or B, is a photograph of the rural urban fringe? Well done, it's A. The rural urban fringe is the zone on the outskirts of the city with large houses and lots of green space. B, of course, is Canary Wharf, so it is one of London's CBDs. Which of these pictures shows the inner city. It's A. So A shows a 1960s tower block that has been built in the inner city. It has a dense population compared to B, which is which shows the suburbs. Okay. So we've looked at London, let's have a look at Sao Paulo in Brazil. Now here is a model that has been proposed for Sao Paulo. It's slightly different from London. So in the centre we have the CBD. Next out we have high quality housing, high quality housing. Next we have poorer quality housing. And on the outskirts, we have shanty towns or slum developments. And then like the sector model, we have these sectors with modern industry and factories following the main transport routes. So this is slightly different from the Burgess model in that the high quality housing is in the middle. And as we go outwards, the, the housing gets a poorer and poorer quality and this is a result of rural urban migration that has happened in Sao Paulo where many people have moved to the city um, without very much money and they have been forced to build their own houses on the outskirts of the city. Let's have a look how this translates to real life. So here's our map of Sao Paulo. The, um, the green sections as before are the surrounding countryside and the gray is the city. So in the middle of Sao Paulo, we have the CBD, the traditional CBD. Yeah, Sao Paulo originally grew up on the back of the coffee trade um, and, these, and, and there's a very um, a thriving um, business district, so the CBD in the middle. Next out, we're expecting high quality housing and indeed on the edge of the CBD we have um, some inner city high quality, uh, very nice housing. Um, this is a district called MoMA, that definitely fits the model. Next out we have poorer quality uh, but permanent housing 
and um, we do find slightly poorer quality permanent housing in the next um, sector. But we also, on the outskirts of Sao Paulo, have the rural urban fringe, which isn't on our model. So this is an area of very, very wealthy um, housing, residential area, lots of gated communities. So this is an area where many commuters live that commute into the city, similar to London, um, but it's, it's very wealthy. Sometimes they're even known to commute by helicopter. Okay, so, so far, with the addition of the rural urban fringe, it seems to fit the model. However, there are two very interesting um, extra sectors that we need to have a think about. These are corticos and favelas. So here is a map superimposed um, of the corticos and the favelas in Sao Paulo. The corticos, as we can see, are located right in the centre of the city and the favelas are mainly around the outside with a few um, encroaching into the city. But what actually are these? So corticos are very old office buildings that are now used as living spaces. They are usually overcrowded with many people living in small rooms. And this is an example of the largest cortico in Sao Paulo. It had 3,000 or more people living here. And it was actually demolished in 2011 um, because it grew into um, a real center for kind of crime and deprivation. Um, but these have grown up because people have been moving or migrating into Sao Paulo. Um, some of them have stayed in the shanty towns, the favelas on the outskirts, um, but increasingly they have been taking over these areas, um, these disused office blocks to live in um, because they're more accessible to the centre of the city. Um, but they have become a, a real kind of issue in Sao Paulo. So those are corticos. The favelas on the outskirts and increasingly moving into the city, um, they're informal settlements and they've grown up due to increasing population due to migration um, into the city. And this is where people basically they take over a piece of empty land, they build their own homes, usually the materials are, are not high quality, um, but over time they improve their own houses. And they're usually found on the rural urban fringe. Now there can be quite strong communities in these areas and um, the, pe the, the jobs in these areas are mostly in the informal sector, um, so these people are, won't be commuting into financial and office jobs in the city. They'll be doing things like um, selling goods in the street, shoe shining or um, litter picking. So we've got, we've had corticos and we have favelas. So let's see where these fit in. Um, the favelas, yeah, so they are, as we can see on this map, mostly on the outskirts of Sao Paulo because this is, these are the areas where there are the most land, but they can be found, can be found inside the city, um, basically wherever there is uh, free land that's not being used, um, a favela may well um, spring up. In contrast, the corticos um, are found further into the city, because they are these old disused office blocks, so they are located where these buildings um, already were. So, as a summary, we have the CBD of Sao Paulo. It's business, it's shopping and retail. Um, it grew up before the 1930s based on coffee training and trading, and there are some modern buildings, so it's being um, constantly kind of rejuvenated. We have the inner city, um, it's a residential area and there's a mix of wealthy and poorer areas as we move out towards the suburbs and there is some re retail to serve these areas. And this um, expanded in the, uh, between the 1930s and the 1980s due to very fast urbanisation. The rural urban fringe a uh, very, very affluent residential area. 
often there are gated communities, um, commuters working and commuting into the financial sector of the CBD, you can see it in the distance there, um, and, and some retail to serve these places. And these are newer areas built from the 1930s onwards. Favelas, again, residential, um, again, from the 1930s onwards when people started migrating to the city for a better life. And this, the kind of jobs in these um, areas are the, the informal economy jobs. Finally, the corticos, uh, which can be found near or in the CBD, uh, residential, again, the informal economy, but they are issues um, because they tend to produce areas with high crime rates. Um, and this sort of started happening in the 1980s onwards. Okay, so does Sao Paulo fit the city structure or the model of the city structure? Um, it does have the CBD in the middle. It does have high quality housing um, around the outside. And then it does have um, the poorer quality, but still permanent housing um, further out. It also has the shantytown settlements on the outskirts. Um, and in addition, it has the rural urban fringe, the very, very large, very uh, wealthy houses on the outskirts. Finally, in addition to the model, Sao Paulo has corticos in the inner city and in the CBD. So these are the large um, blocks of housing that used to be office blocks that have been taken over as residential areas. So Sao Paulo does fit this model with a couple of exceptions and modifications. Does London fit these city structures? So we can say that London does fit the Burgess model. It has CBD in the middle, it has an inner city, it has suburbs and it has a rural urban fringe. Um, with the exception that it does have more than one CBD and these um, are, and some of these are slightly located outside of what we would traditionally see as the CBD area. It also fits the Hoyt model um, because there are sectors of industry and housing going alongside them that follow main transport routes. And these follow roads, they follow canals, and sometimes they le they're leading out to London's airports. Um, so in summary, both cities um, do fit the proposed models um, with some modifications over time. Thanks for listening. I hope you found that useful.